Kellyanne Conway. Thank you welcome for having to the show. Me. Thank you so much. Kellyanne Conway, welcome to The Daily Show. Thank you for having me. You know, there are a few guests I have on my show that get me more people asking the question, why? <laughs> you know, that's what people, I said, I'm, uh, Kellyanne Conway is going to be on the show, and people are like, why? Why have Kellyanne Conway on? And then, you know, some of my friends are like, oh, she's going to lie to you, she's going to flip things around, she's going to spin this, she's going to be, she's going to, why? That's what people ask me the whole way. But you know why they're really asking that. Why? <laughs> you tell me. Because they think they know me. They think the caricature is real, and they don't want to hear from people who disagree with them. I don't think that that's completely true. I think, I think it's, it's very because true of many people. people. I, think it's, I think what happens is people get frustrated, um, especially in America, because they feel like they're being toyed with. You know, and I'm not putting this all on you, by the way. I, I actually found the book interesting because there were parts of the book that I feel like illuminated stories that you, you never told, or parts of being in the Trump presidency that nobody knew about. And, and I guess maybe that, that's like the first question I had about your job and what you were doing with President Trump, and that is when you were working in the White House and you had the position that you had, when you're working for an administration, do you feel like there are times when you have to lie to protect the president, or do you feel like you have to do that because you're furthering a greater good? No, not none of the above. First of all, the president offered me the press secretary job within an hour or an hour and a half of being elected. Mm -hmm in 2016. I said, no, because he said, you'll be great at that. And I'm thinking to myself, I wrote in the book, I'd be a terrible press secretary. I'm not even sure what they do. And so I didn't want a press or comms job. I took a policy job, but I kept getting pulled out um, to speak on behalf of the White House, on behalf of the country. And I have to tell you, people will say, how can you go up against this anchor? They ask me the same question. Why would you go on this show? Why do you deal with that anchor? Right. They're not fair to you. They only prefer Democrats, et cetera. And I say, look, the anchors are never really my audience. The people are the audience. There are folks out there, the forgotten man, forgotten woman, forgotten child, who would not otherwise have access to information, news they can use, facts and figures that affect their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. But there were many times I didn't speak. There were many things I didn't address. I either felt that I was not the expert on them or I didn't have all the answers. But I would note that you know all the smart men around me did not go on TV, did not come and face the music, did not come and explain. Um, I was almost like their mop-up mop girl and spokesmodel sometimes. Um, that's what they wanted, so that they can be behind the scenes working on important policy. And I have to tell you, even this White House, when it started, the Biden-Harris White House, they said, look at us, we have a 100% female press and comp shop. And I thought, well, of course you do, because the women don't get as many policy jobs. And that's what I wanted to do. So I worked on veterans, military, military spouses. I worked on the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. I worked on the opioid mm -hmm, crisis. Mm -hmm. I worked on education, health care reform. The list goes on and on. And you find out in these public service jobs, Trevor, that you can help make a difference in people's lives. And I think that many of the Trump Pence accomplishments have done exactly that. We were better off economically, energy wise. Putin was not in Ukraine, Iran no, no, was not no, no, salivating no, no. at Israel. Forgive, forgive and the list me. goes wait, on. Wait, wait, forgive me. No, no, forgive oh, me. Forgive How me. much did you pay for no, gas today? No, no, forgive me, forgive me. Because you, you're doing the thing that you're very good at right now. And that yes, is. Speaking the truth. No, and that is not, not answering the question that I've asked you. Um, I did answer it. No, no, no. I said no. No, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is this, is... And I, I really... I don't want to have a confrontational conversation with you, because I, I, when I was reading the book, it felt like more of a conversation yes. with you as a person. So, OK, let me, let me ask it this way. So, here you have a situation where, in the book, you talk about how you were oftentimes a voice of reason in the room. I, you know, I have no reason to not believe that. You talk about, in the book, how you said to Donald Trump, hey, you lost the election. You have lost this election. Well, what I actually said was, we were talking about the December 14th deadline. That was the date by which the electors would certify the election. Right. And they were about to certify it for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. And in the six weeks prior to that, I had long left the White House, but in the six weeks prior to that, the president and his legal team were trying to find proof of theft and fraud and malfeasance and shenanigans. And I think there are many unanswered questions from 2020 we'll, we'll never know. But the main thing you said to him but was? But I said to him, you're coming up short. It looks like you're coming up short for that certification date. Other people, Trevor, then had the idea. No, no, wait, wait, don't go to other people. Wait, wait, honestly. No, no, no to I'm... go to January 6th no, and no. do a different certification. I don't know about January 6th, though. I'm saying, in this case, it, this is what I'm saying is interesting, is you said this in the book, right? I'm talking about a now issue. You said this in the book. Since the book came out, Donald Trump has come out on, I think it was Truth Social, and he said, no, Kellyanne Conway is lying. She never said that to me. She never told me that I lost. And if she told me that, I would have fired her on the spot. So let's say, like, in that instance, 
it's you, it's Donald Trump. So who's telling the truth? He didn't use the words liar or fire, but what he said was, I wouldn't have dealt with her anymore. That's not a good criterion. I wouldn't have to dealt deal with, with her anymore. Is... But um, I told him, <laughs> I, I told him that he came up short and it broke my heart. I wish he were still the president because things so, were much so better. You're saying, so you're saying you did tell him. And so he's, I did when tell he's him saying he was you coming up short for December 14th. Right. But and I'm saying, but this is what I, this is what I mean. Had, well, no, this, I'm very no, no. candid and very honest. Yes, and by the way, I, this is not one of these tell all and bore most. I'm not speaking up now because I didn't speak up then. God knows I spoke up then. You, but this you is did my indeed. memoir. You There's 500 indeed. pages in there. Yes. My life story, certainly time as campaign manager, yes. making history as the first female Com completely. campaign and we, manager. We get, we're going to get to that. And we're gonna senior counselor to the president and what that meant. Allow me to move through it step by step. I promise you I'm going to get to those parts. What I'm asking you. So I think you've answered in this case. So you're saying that is the truth is that you told him. And you said broke Look, your Joe heart Biden's to Joe Biden's the president. I don't think everything was completely fair and transparent. No, 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 no I'm not but asking Joe Biden's about that. You see, you're doing the and Kellyanne Conway. You see, the people are right now with me. The people who said to me she's going to do the thing to you, you're doing the thing to me right now. That Joe Biden's the president? No, I didn't ask you that question, though. OK. The question I asked you was, who's telling the truth? That's honestly what I asked you. I didn't ask you about who's president, who's not president. I said, who's telling the truth? As in, you told one side of the story. Donald Trump told another side of the story. And what you're telling me is, you're saying his side of the story is not true. I'm telling you that I told him before the December 14th deadline right, that which they were he coming up short. With. So, so maybe, maybe this is what I'm trying to say. In this, in this book, what I found particularly interesting is you, you've given us an insight into the Trump White House and, and how it worked or how sometimes it didn't work. You know, you, you've had some of the more scathing opinions on people like Jared Kushner, for instance. You, you, don't, you don't mince your words in the book about Jared, you know, or Steve Bannon. And it, it, you know, it, it, it feels like you, you felt like at times they, you know, got away with not being as good at the job as you felt they should have been. Well, I think if the president, your boss in a workplace, asks you to work together as yeah. a team, you should try to do that. And mm -hmm. this just happened to be the West Wing, so it was very important that people be collaborative and not confrontational. I felt that, not I felt, there was a lot of undercutting, if not usurping, of other people's duties and responsibilities. And there was a lot of gratuitously nasty stuff going on also. And it happened at the very beginning. And here's someone who, you know, along with George, my husband, made a decision to move to Washington, D.C., move our children there. He, too, took a big job in the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. We have that in common. And we're, we're doing all this, and I have people constantly knifing me, constantly throwing logs in my path. Now, I had two choices, and I think a lot of women in the workplace will relate to this, Trevor. I had two choices. I can sort of slink away or cry under the desk and hope the emotional shrapnel doesn't hit me, or I can hold my head high and forge ahead and try to be one small molecule that's working for positive change. Um, in the end, I mean, a lot of those guys got fired, slinked away in shame, That's true. didn't last That's long. True. Um, and I think in many, in many cases, my balls were bigger. And, it, and <laughs> in fact, actually, actually to that question, to that, to that point, let's talk about the guns. Here. So this is, this is a moment. You were an advisor to the president. This is what I find interesting. One of my strangest moments, even during the show, was when Donald Trump, President Donald Trump came out and he said, there was a, there was a mass shooting, and he said, you know what we need to do? We need to raise, raise the age limit. He said, we need to ban assault rifles. He, needs, he said, you Republicans who don't want to do it, you're scared of the NRA. He came out, he had all of these measures, which I said, even on the show, I was like, this is amazing, this is fantastic. Many were shocked. But then we've learned recently that there were, there were some of his insiders who convinced him. I think like Mick Mulvaney was one of them who said, don't do it, you're gonna lose if you don't. Trump said, I don't care, we need to do this. And he got convinced out of it. Now, I, I would love to know from your perspective, how did his team convince him out of something when, I mean, this was the man who, everyone said, don't, you can't build a wall. He said, I'm gonna go and build this wall, right. you know? You can't ban Muslims, he's like, I'm gonna find a way to do it. How did they convince him? <laughs> what do we not know about the gun lobby and the gun world? that they managed to push Donald Trump away from his initial position. Well, respectfully, the premise is flawed because I was in those conversations and he did talk about different measures, but they didn't come to the they didn't come to the Senate. They didn't come they didn't reach his desk. A president has to sign into law things that the United States Congress has the guts to put there and they oh, did not. Now, I want, I also want to say true, this. Though. I was there um, for Parkland. I was there after the Parkland mm -hmm. Valentine's Day 2018. And by the way, I'm not blaming murder. Trump, by the way. I'm just asking, no, no. I'm and asking I how he got you. shifted from his position. And then I flew with him to Santa Fe, yeah. Texas, when, when there was a shooting there. Eight children were killed, eight high schoolers and two teachers there. And what I learned the entire time is that people are very 
quick to say it's this problem, it's that problem. It's actually a spectrum. You know, it's never one thing that Completely. causes it, and it's never one thing that can solve it. Right, but then nothing gets done. So nothing has gotten done. And again, if you've got a president that's been there for 50 years, I hope he will, because he Joe can Biden, say, Marie, Joe no, Biden no, I hope been he there can. For 50 years. I know, I know but you're probably no, booing but him. No, 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 I don't Donald blame Trump you. was there. No. Yeah. This is what I'm, he does I'm saying. Stink. I'm, I'm saying. Say I'm saying to you as an advisor, like, and I and I mean this honestly as as a. But as you're a, playing as a Kellyanne person. Conway, like you're not even a fan of the semicolon no, tonight. No, I'm no, just no. listening. What what I'm saying to you is, in the position that you are in, and the position that you may find yourself in again, because you you do have the ear of many powerful Republicans. You do have, you know, you, you're in a you're in the rare position of speaking to Donald Trump and Mike Pence right now. You're one of the few people who is the yeah. connective tissue of many parts of the Republican Party, both the old and the new. And so maybe I would even ask you then, as an advisor now, what are some of the common sense ideas that you think could be passed? Because I think these are moments that shouldn't be Republican some. or Democrat. These are just children. Do you get what well, I'm saying? You just, so, you just said the most important word here. I know people talk about guns and mental health and hardening the targets. I'm thinking through the vantage of, the vantage point of the children. And we should just start there in all of these matters. And I learned that in listening to the Parkland families. I learned that after the Dayton shooter had his juvenile records were kept private. In other words, his privacy versus the security of other people. I learned that when we looked at Parkland and you saw the FBI had visited many times and nobody ever did anything. These um, people, these madmen, this moral depravity, these evil people, they usually broadcast their intention. They're bragging about, I want to be a school shooter. Look at me. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And so we should take that seriously. I mean, here they say, if you see something, say something. They mean a backpack in the subway. I think the people who are around these folks and are afraid of them and believe that they could do should feel free to go to the authority under cover of privacy, go to the authorities and report that. Here's what I think should happen with the children. You know, Trevor, if we just acted with the same gusto to protect our children from violence in the schools that we did to protect them from the virus, which we should have done. Um, we now have $112 billion in last year's American Rescue Plan in, po in post-pandemic money for, um, for the schools. 92% of it, according to the Wall Street Journal last week, is unspent. Why? Well, because they already did the ventilation, they already did the stickers, we already did the masks. Now we're moving on to it's earmarked for mental health. It's earmarked for more teachers and counselors. It's earmarked for lost learning. And we should be spending that money. It's seven billion just here in New York City, the largest school district in the country. And it's not spent yet because it expires in September 2024. They're trying to figure out how to do it. Let's take that money, it's already been passed and approved by the president. Let's take that money and shift it over to keeping our kids safe in these schools. My goodness, we so, have so we keep athletes safe, guns? politicians no, no, safe. No, I'm saying nothing on the no, side of guns No, themselves. of course not. 19 states have red flag walls. These states have taken action where Washington has not. In fact, the state of Florida with a Republican state legislator, Republican Governor Rick Scott, um, passed red flag laws after Parkland, Florida. So it is possible, as people are saying, do something, say something, to do something. And I don't know what's going to happen in Congress. I'd like to feel more hopeful that people will come to their senses and think about how to keep these kids safe because it should not be an occupational hazard for any child um, to go to school and to fear for their lives, obviously, or their safety. But there are so many signs along the way, and people should feel free. Instead of judging everybody's social media posts and, and calling everybody names and mm -hmm. canceling people, why don't we say, that person's slinging an AR-15 online, saying he aspires to be a school shooter. Half the class is afraid of him. Why don't we do something about that? So I think it's all that. And I, I was disappointed to hear Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut um, say last week, don't give me the bullshit about mental health. Uh, we don't have any more mental health problems in other countries. Excuse me, it is a big problem here. It may be in other countries too, but we have to look at that. We have to start investing in that. Um, so yes, I believe in the case of Buffalo, there was a red flag should have been triggered and the authorities did not do anything about it. The Buffalo shooter um, here in Uvalde, this, this um, murderer, who just recently turned 18, I believe, there were warning signs mm -hmm. and people were afraid of him. And they said he would you know, torture cats and brag about, I'm going to rape you, I'm gonna be a school shooter. I think you have to take people like that seriously and not just look the other way. So there is a whole spectrum of solutions that so we should I, look so at. So if I hear what you're saying correctly in that situation, which I would agree with is what you're saying is, if you look at these red flags, if you look at these moments ahead of time, you can find reasons to restrict people from gaining access to guns because you're saying we see that this is not conducive to society right, Not safe. everybody should have it because if you're operating a machine, no, it's just that, like having a, a, you know, any I didn't other, think we'd have an agreement any on Any other show. machine, any <laughs> other. <laughs> I didn't, this we is We agree on many things, believe me. I listen to you and, this is, uh... and, and look, I, this country, I write in my book at the end, the, the, um, the 
publisher, Simon & Schuster, the head there asked me, can you dig a little bit deeper and try to unify the country? I'm like, sure, that sounds easy. And I did try. And one thing I said I think is incredibly important for us all to realize is that, sure, we can talk about bipartisanship, we can talk about finding common ground. I always think that's valuable. But we also need to realize that not everybody in this country wants to wear the red or blue uniform 24-7, 365. We don't want politics in every conversation, collaboration, consideration, every meal, every conversation um, at your place of worship or your place of work and the kids' playground. You have, we have much more in common in this beautiful country filled with amazing people than people realize, but these cultural cleavages are very real. And we have to, we have to confront that. We have to... I, th I think deal with that. And look, if Donald Trump wants to be president again, it's the simplest path is not to look backward. It's to run against Joe Biden. He can have a cage match rematch. And I think people will pay attention to that. That's what he wants to do. That's the, that's the smoothest, easiest path. That's the smoothest, easiest path if he really wants to do that. But, um, but we have to also respect that the growing number of people in this country, they are upset with go what's going on in Washington. They feel excluded from the process, excluded I, from the system. Oh, can I tell you what I think happens in America that's particularly interesting is America is one of the few countries I've lived in where politicians complain about politics being a tool that should be used to change a country when they are in the position of changing the They're country that. They love it. using their politics. That's right. yes. It's, yes. it's been great having you on the show. I could chat to you for hours. Thank Unfortunately, you. we have the time that we have. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for joining me. Not many people would. Kellyanne's memoir, Here's the Deal, is available right now.